Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, I welcome you all to the International Young Scholars Summit 2020. I extend a very warm welcome to our chair for the session, Ambassador Anil Trignuyat, fellow scholars and participants who have joined us through Zoom and are watching this live on Facebook. We're glad to witness your presence today. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young scholars from all around the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and related subfields. The conference will be held for three days consecutively and will have 30 different sessions with two sessions running parallelly throughout in white and green rooms. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 countries who will be delivering their presentations and sharing their understanding on various topics with us. The session is streaming live on our Facebook, so feel free to share it on your social media handle with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is the second session of the conference. To chair and moderate this session, it's a real, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have with us Ambassador Anil Sir with us. Ambassador Anil Trignath is a distinguished fellow at Vivekananda International Foundation, India, and a visiting fellow at NICE. He's a member of the Indian Foreign Service and has served in Indian missions in Bangladesh, Mongolia, USA, Russia, etc. Mr. Trignath has worked as Deputy Chief of Mission in the rank of Ambassador in the Embassy of India and Moscow. Prior to his supranation in May 2016, he served as Ambassador of India to Jordan, Libya, and High Commissioner to Malta. He is a postgraduate in physics from Agra University and also studied Russian history, culture, and language at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Ambassador Anil Sir is a member of All India Management Association, Delhi Management Association, as well that of Oxford and Cambridge Society of India and the Association of India Diplomats. He is also the honorary member of International Trade Council, Brussels. Without any further ado, sir, I request you to chair this session. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Bakhi, Thank for you. those very kind words. A very good morning to all the participants and our distinguished panelists today. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the NICE for organizing this exceptionally desirable and very important event uh, with making the youth think about how the key policy uh, issues in the world, in the international arena, are playing out. So it is extremely important uh, what we are seeing today. It is extremely difficult situation across the world. Uh, but then the, the whole purpose of studying uh, international relations and engaging in diplomacy is to avoid those conflicts. And the conflicts, I find that the theme of most of our uh, discussions today, way or the other, related to that particular uh, issue that we are facing today. Because what is happening today, in my view, will actually decide the course of the world order that we are, we are going to confront uh, in the post-pandemic uh, era. There are many challenges that every country is facing. How we are going to get out of this, there is uh, at the top of the uh, spectrum, as we know that the, it's very crowded. And right now we have only one hyperpower and the other hyperpower, superpower, China is trying to displace it. Whether it has called the shots a bit earlier remains to be seen. And I hope uh, the uh, panelists uh, will try to look at this uh, uh, from that perspective as uh, exactly how China is playing out its cards and whether it is going to succeed, whether it is in South China Sea or in West Asia or in the context of US-China relations. So uh, I'm very happy for two reasons. One is that it is an important topics that we are going to discuss today. And secondly, the panel has, uh, I think majority of the panelists are ladies. And therefore we can uh, uh, hope to have a more balanced and well calculated uh, outcomes from this conference, uh, from your individual uh, experiences, the studies, the research. And I hope to uh, see you. The couple of things I would like to say is that each panelist will speak for, we have about two hour session. So we'd like to give more time to the question answers. 
So if we have about eight panelists, therefore each one may take maximum eight to 10 minutes, not more than that. Please control yourself, keep your time. Uh, I will only come if it really exceeds. So I hope everybody is able to do the key points on that particular thing. I would like to invite the first speaker, uh, Ms. P. Lal Ram Shyami, who is the assistant professor at the Government Moment College, India. And she'll be talking about China's dilemma in the South China Sea. And as you all know that the South China Sea is today an area of contestation, not only between China and the ASEAN countries, but also between the China, between China and the United States and the Western countries. A lot has changed there. It is getting hotter by the day. And uh, the, there have been deployments by the US Naval Forces in the region. And there is a fear that because of the Taiwan Straits and uh, the situation in China and it's flexing the muscles all over, uh, we might see a much hotter uh, scenario than what exists today. And this is more so as we are running into uh, the US elections, because a lot is to be done by China's own acts. At the same time, also the United States brinkmanship uh, in this regard. So one does not know whether uh, what will be the outcome. We hope it will be a merely a talk show, but we do not know really how it's going to play out because a very small incident uh, can lead to a major uh, conflict and which will not be desirable for the world at this stage when the global economies are going under. And uh, no country can really afford uh, to go into war except those who are manufacturing weapons and are the weapon exporting state. So, but let us see, much ado, uh, without ado, I would like to request uh, Professor Lal Ram Siami uh, to dwell on her case. Thank you. Please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, um, uh, Ambassador and Nilsar, for your warm introduction. And uh, thank you, Nepal Nice, for organizing this uh, opportunity. Sir, um, can I share my screen, sir? Sorry? You have a can slide? Can I share my screen, sir? Yes, please. Okay. And you have to speak a bit louder, I guess. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, uh, today I will be talking about China's dilemma in the South China Sea, and here it goes. Uh, as we know that China was a minor global player for a long time, and uh, the Chinese kingdom had a prestigious history, and this was uh, suffered a huge relapse during the World War years, and this paved the way for the uh, mindset of restoration of the Chinese nation among the Chinese leaders. And the founding philosophy of restoring China uh, inheres in the revival of Chinese legacy embedded in holding the reins of power. And this exclusive determination is purposefully driven by uh, economic and geopolitical motives with political security enhancement, and uh, which is well, this is well witnessed in the South China Sea, uh, in the Chinese policy on South China Sea. And we know that the Supreme series over the South China Sea uh, appears in the 21st century, um, Asia's most geopolitical dispute. And uh, there are numerous significances of the South China Sea besides its uh, diverse island, islands, atolls, hydrocarbons. It's, uh, the South China Sea is a, uh, uh, serves as a crucial international sea link for many centuries, uh, which further enhance the significances of the sea. And due to these many multifarious reasons, the South China Sea is uh, contested by six literal parties now. And let us see China's anticipation in the South China Sea. Uh, China is naturally a seaborne trading nation and the 
Maritime policy occupies the nuts and bolts of China's foreign policy since the early part of history. The Chinese writers give utterance that the, Ch the South China Sea is an intrinsic entitlement of successive Chinese dynasties. In its contemporary race of superpower game, China largely formulates grandiose uh, maritime policies pertinent to its economic growth. The South China Sea is such one where China's uh, many dependence on its route remains fundamental. Moreover, an implicit vision on the South China Sea lies at the heart of the Chinese leaders due to uh, the fact that the South China Sea occupy a vital cradle of China's power proje projection in the region. And uh, due to these uh, reasons, the South China Sea, uh, uh, the, to the Chinese, the South China Sea holds numerous significances and China has paved the way for legalizing its claims in the South China Sea. It has passed numerous laws like the uh, Continental Chinese Territorial Law 1992 and uh, also it has produced an official map called the Nine Dash Line and produced in front of the world. Uh, this is the Chinese Nine Dash Line map uh, and let us go to the Chinese dilemma in the South China Sea. Uh, the Chinese call the South China Sea as Nanhai or the South Sea, which forms numerous significances to the Chinese. China intends to project herself as a formidable sea power uh, since the ancient period. Uh, countries of Southeast Asia and East Asia's economies have largely been dependent on the Chinese economy and hence China is widely held as an economic shield and geopolitical clout in the region. Uh, keeping this in mind, China wishes to maintain uh, the status quo in the region and did not uh, favor any outside interference to, uh, to disturb her superiority in the region. This goes well in tandem with Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping dictum called the China's Asian Dream. Uh, China to a considerable extent has a strong vested interest in dictating international shipping route as an advantage of its national power. And there is a clear indication that the contending parties of the South China Sea literals are hooked up in a, a supremacy squabble over the South China Sea. All claiming parties have almost uh, mm, these territorial disputes with China and tiny overlapping claims existed between the others. Uh, the increasing activities of the South China Sea uh, by the China have heightened tensions. However, except for some trivial skirmishes existed between uh, China and other claimant states over the years, uh, deadly pitfalls remain avoided until now among the literal parties. This could possibly be attributed to Chinese preponderating, preponderating maneuver, which it exerts through economic domineering in the region. And uh, to this end, the weaker nation in the geopolitical game developed fear psychosis in China. What leaps up the circumstances in the um, 21st century is the acute circumspection of the non claimant state. Uh, uh, specifically, the International Tribunal ruling on the Philippines case in June 2016 break the silence of international community. And countries like the United States, India, Australia, Japan outwardly imposed high intense pressure on China and urged conflicting parties to uh, remain with the United Nations Conventions on the Laws of the Seas, 1982. In the meantime, Chinese foreign affairs response to the international ruling shows China's accorded precedence of its national law over international law. Moreover, China, uh, China wanted to keep the South China Sea dispute away from external powers interference, which is a point of divergence between the literal parties. The less powerful literal parties wishes internationalization of the dispute, but China wish favors bilateral solution of the dispute. What makes the situation worsen? 
today uh, is uh, that to America, disputes in the South China Sea is not merely a far-flung uh, regional dispute over islands, rocks, and reefs. The United States is definitely one of the most uh, prominent countries uh, reluctant to see Beijing-led security architecture in Asia. As an important step towards this goal, the United States used the South China Sea as a military reconnaissance in the uh, in recent years, especially as we witnessed in this year, in the mid months of this year, China's unilateral legal order in the South China Sea aggravates uh, the United States and other countries, reiterating the significance of maintaining freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And here it goes the conclusion. Recent years of development witnessed the interface of rising uh, equity of external powers on the one hand and China's assertiveness of her claims on the others. This has been manifested in the form of a confrontational approach. It is discernible that China exhibits her psychological prowess uh, to the international community. The growing gust of apprehension in the South China Sea dispute especially appears to be the involvement of external powers which signals that if the situation gets worse, the world might witness uh, the recurrence of Cold War dilemma or more or a uh, uh, worse case of South China Sea, uh, and which could disrupt international harmony. If such a thing happened, China would have uh, uh, increasing fellow contenders in the South China Sea dispute which could immensely disrupt its national growth. To a great height, the future of South China Sea conflict places reliance on the actions of China. Uh, nevertheless, the existing situation proves that China will not hold back her claims in the South China Sea. Uh, if so, uh, China, uh, the question remains that could China still preserve her international status while gaining control in the South China Sea? And that is my presentation, sir. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lalrissi. I mean, this is a very uh, pointed and uh, uh, pointed presentation, which dwelt on, of course, uh, the Chinese trying its hegemony in the region. Mm. And uh, South China Sea, it considers its maritime fiefdom. And uh, it's a red line for Red China. And therefore, we are seeing the conflict that is uh, ensuing and building up. You refer to <clears throat> the Chinese confrontational approach, and uh, that is probably what uh, a superpower in the being does, and it's trying to protect it. But uh, you cannot dictate in today's world. Yesterday, you must have seen the East Asia Summit. There was a meeting, and the Americans are trying to take along all these ASEAN countries and saying, don't even talk, act. So Germany came out with Indo-Pacific strategy, and we'll be discussing that in the EU uh, session. Uh, but I find that it is, uh, uh, you mentioned about Cold War 2.0, and the Cold War actually is not going to be exactly the same as Soviet Union was with Soviet Union, but today China is a far, powerful economic power. So we have seen the trade war in the last four years of Trump's uh, presidency. Uh, which is a very important part of the thing. And secondly, when this virus uh, came out, it has caused a bigger problem. And so China, the way it used uh, to defend its actions during the pandemic has brought uh, its own friends uh, into a disarray. And today that is the problem that everybody feels a bit threatened. And we see what is happening on different uh, Theaters, including in India. And uh, so thank you very much. It was very, very clear, concise, and you rightly mentioned that it will depend on China's actions as to how the things will play out eventually. And we hope that uh, China realizes it has defied in the case of Philippines, the ICJ judgment, because it, as you said, uh, it prefers national law and international law. What is the point in being international or you being in the UN Security Council when you do not respect the international law? But in that, uh, China is not alone. USA has very often not carried out the thing. It has not even joined the ICC. So all the superpowers are at fault when it comes to not 
following the start of the international. Uh, now uh, we have uh, Rahul Palani Sami, who is a senior fellow at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Is he there with us? Uh, sir, he has certain connectivity issues, so uh, we will be accommodating him towards the end, as well as we'll be accommodating uh, Ms. Akriti towards the end. Okay, what about Nagapushka Devendra? She is here, I guess. Is she there? If she's here, uh, if, if she's not here as well, you may proceed with the next speaker. I'll get in touch with her as well. Akriti is not there. So, Julia, now next, then I'll request Julia Sofia Kusela, a student from Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. She is going to discuss China's strategic interests in Central Asia within the BRI framework. And obviously, the BRI is uh, uh, the new, uh, so since, of course, 2016, 13 onwards. But what we are seeing now in uh, this particular uh, domain is how the COVID impact is going to play out on the BRI. And uh, are, is there, because the Central Asian countries, it is extremely important for all the major players now today. So how the uh, Uyghurs issue also you may wish to discuss uh, because they have very similar descendancy as from the Central Asia. Xinjiang province is connected to it. Is quite close. Thirdly, I would request you if you can talk about a little bit about the China's recent claims over the territories in certain countries in Central Asia. Now, uh, that's a trend that they did to Russia. They said Vladivostok belonged to them, Far East. They talked about uh, India, several states in Nepal, in different countries. Yeah, they are looking for more and more territory. So, if you could touch upon those in you during your presentation. Over to you, Julia. Okay, thank you, sir. Please unmute yourself. Uh, could you tell me if I am audible? Uh, please speak louder, actually. I don't know. I'm not... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We can. Okay. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, China's strategic interests uh, in uh, Central Asia within the Belt and Road Framework. Actually, after settling border issues with uh, Central Asian states in 2000s, uh, Beijing embarked on a strategy of ensuring mutual political and uh, economic understanding with uh, these countries. Uh, as for the present stage, uh, the SIAP caters, uh, caters for an array of tasks from working closely on pressing security aspects, for example, fighting the three evils, to implementing the Chinese soft power tactics uh, through cultural exchange and the network of uh, Confucius Institutes in uh, the area. Nowadays, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, lends itself uh, as a platform for furthering China-Central Asia interdependencies and enhancing Chinese presence uh, there in terms of uh, financial assets, infrastructure, and labor force. Um, political elites of uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan welcome these joint activities under the BRIC framework, uh, which are occasionally represented as direct development uh, assistance amidst uh, public concerns over growing Chinese presence. These uh, foreign uh, investments create uh, preconditions for certain compromises in other areas uh, beneficial for Beijing. Uh, in fact, uh, there are three prerequisites and uh, three interest areas of the initiative uh, with uh, regards to Central Asia. The first is uh, ensuring state integrity. China strives uh, for the economic development of Xinjiang, uh, where social instability is due to the rigorous assimilation policy. To 2 million residents have uh, ethnic ties with Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. China, well aware of uh, separatist trends uh, and uh, different groups affiliated with uh, Uyghurs, is uh, set to pursue a coherent uh, policy of uh, Xinjiang's uh, inclusion into the Belt and Road land-based uh, route. 
along with being a solution to the problem of uh, region's uh, economic and uh, social development. Its uh, integration into the Chinese economy will ensure a new impetus uh, for local labor market and uh, infrastructure. It is not worthy that uh, uh, in Central Asia, um, uh, uh, after the cooperation of uh, Beijing and Central Asian states, uh, various uh, nationalist uh, organization uh, groups of uh, Uyghurs were, were shut down. The second thing is uh, boosting the level of energy security of China. Uh, due to the fact that uh, in 2017, China overtook the U.S. and uh, became the world's largest uh, importer of crude oil because of the rising number of new refineries, which uh, serve the need of Chinese industry and transport. Actually, the construction of uh, oil and gas pipelines within the Belt and Road uh, projects is concentrated along the Sino-Russian border and uh, throughout territories leading to the Caspian Sea. Uh, China seeks to pave uh, routes for the safe supply of energy resources from the Central Asian republics, in particular Kazakhstan, which is uh, rich in oil and gas, uh, which are necessary, for Chinese economy. Kazakhstan, in turn, is a corridor on the way to Europe, providing a quick and cost-effective access to markets and the recipient of the transit income. Uh, of course, uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, other states encounter uh, issues uh, related to debt sustainability, contributing to the national financial burden. Um, uh, because of China, which uh, gives um, out huge loans. Finally, it is giving uh, impetus to state-owned enterprises uh, since uh, the founding of the PRC, the rulers have relied on state-owned enterprises uh, to carry out domestic uh, economic policies and uh, their importance is still high in the modern-day uh, economy. Therefore, the Belton Road uh, Initiative uh, is an attempt to create new opportunities for the involvement in the production uh, and uh, it's a chance to turn on profitable enterprises into econ economically independent ones. They become executors and beneficiaries of economic projects abroad along with the chance of uh, exploiting opportunities of uh, Chinese uh, excessive uh, industrial capacity. Um, given the existing disagreements uh, uh, between uh, China and Central Asia regarding transboundary rivers, policies towards ethnic minorities and uh, a range of other controversial issues, it is important for China to establish partnerships with uh, the states and uh, deepen bilateral relations uh, while stressing the importance of the Belt and Road uh, and which expands uh, its uh, corridors to the west. However, uh, anti-Chinese uh, sentiments and criticism is being manifested by local dwellers in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, as for example in uh, 2019. Um, summing up, China is becoming the largest investor, trade partner and creditor for its neighboring less developed economies that uh, unfortunately may fall uh, into its sphere of influence and economic dependence uh, while uh, becoming uh, long-term partners uh, in fulfilling Beijing's uh, regional and economic ambitions. I'd say that's it. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very succinct and uh, very pointed uh, points that you made about uh, the Chinese actions in the Central Asian region. It is an extremely important region. Uh, but perhaps there will be questions about uh, how does Russia look at uh, China's increasing influence uh, in uh, Central Asia? Uh, that's important, of course. Uh, there, there are uh, voices of uh, concern in some of these countries about these continued uh, Chinese uh, expansion, as well as uh, the uh, problem of debt trap uh, that might uh, give it give them a little bit of uh, uh, problems in the future so we don't know exactly how it will play out and whether the ethnic 
uh, issues that you mentioned about Uyghurs, uh, how far some of these very, very Islamic countries would uh, be able to take it and whether China will be able to, in a shorter time, resolve this problem, which looks very likely today. Most, you know, that the Western countries have started Uyghur as a very major uh, high op against China and trying to corner them on this and human rights and all over the places. So that is going to play out. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the, some of the Western countries are also interested in Central Asia as well. So is India. So we'll look, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, We'll come back when the questions arise. Now, do we have Ms. Liana Dashan? Uh, no, sir. She wouldn't be joining us today. You may have Mr. Raghul with you as of now. Please come. Yes, sir. Mr. Raghul? Yes, sir. I'm here. Oh, you are there. Very good. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Sir. Well, friends, now as I've already introduced him, Rag, Mr. Ragul Palani Sami is a senior fellow at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, Sino, and he'll be speaking on Sino US technology decoupling, uh, Huawei and the chip wars. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, in this later half of the 20th, uh, 21st century, uh, the world is going to be a place where technology will play a role artificial intelligence, the industrial revolution 4.0. And so the real competition is going to be at the arena of technology, where China is very well placed. Uh, China, I read somewhere, produces the largest number of uh, research papers in the world in the scientific journals. Uh, they have allocated over $150 billion for the artificial intelligence and for their next stage. Of course, the competition or the other conflict, uh, if you divide, uh, if you were to look at it between what is happening on the 5G domain, Huawei has actually uh, taken an advantage and has been advantageous position as far as 5G is concerned, compared to the Western countries who are still uh, struggling to uh, come up with some kind of uh, an alternate solution. But in the meantime, they wanted to uh, deny China the market. And China has been the way it has not nurtured its constituencies to that extent is facing a stiff competition and especially from the Western world and including in India and they are going to uh, find it difficult to introduce uh, some of their uh, projects, especially the Huawei's 5G. Yeah, and so we are going to uh, find out, of course, the chip wars. Chip, chip is the most important component and let's see how it works out. So floor is yours, Mr. Rav. Thank you, sir. So, uh... So if you look at the U.S. and the Chinese economies, uh, for quite like for three decades, it had the, both the economies are deeply intertwined. So in, recently, in 2018, the bilateral trade was about uh, 660 billion U.S. dollars. So this kind of coupling uh, was termed as uh, uh, Chimerica by Neil Ferguson and uh, Martin uh, Shaleriak uh, in 2006. So what? Uh, but the advent, uh, but the coming of Great Recession, it uh, uh, it unraveled a, a deep. Uh, Problem with uh, problem in this uh, form of decoupling, so there was a need for uh, some form of adjustments. Uh, so like China wa had to like both agree to uh, adjust the economy so that like uh, the uh, global imbalance is corrected. Uh, so like um, this, uh, after immediately after the recession, their first step towards decoupling was taken, but it wasn't successful. And there had been uh, so many complaints about Chinese unfair trade practices towards the Obama years. So when uh, President Trump was, uh, as a candidate, President Trump, he wanted to take uh, strict actions against China's uh, unfair trade practices. So he started his, uh, once into office, he started his trade war. And uh, one, of the, uh, in, one of the initial steps, he imposed 25% tariffs on uh, US tech goods, uh, which are related to the uh, Made in China uh, 2025 plan. Um, so if you look at uh, Huawei and uh, uh, US tech decoupling, uh, uh, Trump administration's first action uh, against Huawei was to ban uh, the uh, telecom, co it's telecom components from the US uh, market uh, in May 2019. So it was followed by uh, it's uh, uh, it just followed by placing the uh, Huawei uh, in uh, US entity list. So which means like it, uh, its products, uh, the US uh, chip company, semiconductor companies will be a, a bought from selling uh, its uh, chips to Huawei without the permission or license from US uh, Commerce Department. Um, 
So, so like, wh why is it so important? Why is uh, uh, US targeting Huawei? It's because like, uh, like uh, uh, this 5G technology, which the Huawei is mastering, it uh, it is the it provides a platform all, for all the future tech, uh, future industries, like which you call the industries of the future, like for industries 4.0. So those kind of industries, uh, uh, once uh, China dominates the 5G environment, then it will be like uh, the future uh, scenario will be complete. The future tech scenario will be complete in Chinese hands, and uh, the US will be losing its dominance in technology field to the uh, to China. So that is the reason one, uh, why, despite uh, uh, claiming that the Huawei uh, poses national security threat to the US, the main reason is the technology dominance threat which uh, Huawei poses uh, to the US in the future. So like due to this uh, entity list uh, addition, um, most of the US uh, semiconductor companies like uh, Intel, Micron, and, uh, and uh, chip making equipment suppliers and many uh, Chips or designs to tool providers. All those, all mostly these are all U.S. companies. They are bought from supplying their products and software to uh, Huawei. Uh, so it wasn't enough because, like, uh, uh, the ban initially did not cover those uh, chips which are export, uh, which are uh, supplied from uh, overseas manufacturers. So uh, in recently, in May 2020, what uh, Trump administration he tightened it uh, to plug the loopholes. It tightened the uh, regulations and uh, it made sure that. Uh, uh, chips from overseas uh, uh, manufacturers, like those uh, U.S. companies which provides or uh, produces overseas and uh, sells to Huawei, so they are also bought from uh, supplying uh, to Huawei. So it's, this move uh, mainly targets uh, the uh, TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, because it it, uh, it is the main supplier to um, um, it also supplies uh, chips to Huawei's base stations. So the point here is. Uh, TSMC manufactures chips using the uh, US uh, 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 semiconductor equipments. So uh, this move, like it bans com completely bans TSMC supply to Huawei. Uh, so it is a major uh, uh, impact on the Huawei's tech ambitions. So beyond this uh, ban and uh, embargoes, the uh, Trump administration had been lobbying its allies for quite long time, like nearly two years to uh, uh, to. Uh, to ask them to like they it had been uh, lobbying them to ban Huawei uh, from their own side, like uh, so uh, complying with the uh, Trump administration demands. Like um, uh, many Western countries like Australia, UK recently, and New Zealand, Taiwan, Japan, and those uh, those countries have already banned Huawei. But uh, uh, so likewise, like following pressure from the US, the Dutch government uh, recently blocked the supply of products from its chief equipment company ASML to China. So uh, besides uh, Trump administration's own decoupling, China had been trying to decouple itself from the U.S. economy for uh, nearly a decade. So it's uh, uh, it is because like China, the Chinese policymakers worry that their economy is too dependent on labor, labor intensive, low in manufacturing, and too reliant on foreign technology. Um, so uh, the main ambition of China is to move up in the value chain and attain self, uh, technological self sufficiency in future. Uh, Chinese government's actions, uh, policy actions in this direction in the indigenous innovation policy brought out in 2006, and uh, it was followed by the Made in China 2025 and Made in 2015. Uh, the focus of uh, the Made in China plan uh, is to uh, increase the uh, domestic content in core components and uh, materials uh, to about 70% by 2025 uh, in key sectors, including the next generation telecommunications. Um, the focus of the plan so therefore, the focus of the plan is to ma master the advanced semiconductor manufacturing. Um, while uh, with the, uh, so other than that, uh, the Beijing's recent advancements in industrial research methods and big data, combined with its uh, uh, industrial who has industrial know-how, uh, could help China to uh, attain a rapid technological leap in the semiconductor industry. So moreover, it had, like, recently uh, the mainland China has uh, hired 3,000 Taiwanese chip engineers. Uh, moreover, uh, American companies do not completely dominate the chip equipment industry. According to a, uh, a report produced by VLSI Research, four, four uh, for Japanese companies, along with one Singapore and one American, uh, European company, uh, share the market with uh, American chip equipment makers in different segment of the chip fabrication process. So, which means, always means that China's advanced chip fabrication dreams will not meet the end then following the recent actions taken by the Trump administration. So uh, to conclude, like I would say that the Trump administration's actions uh, potent its belief that only through a chip war could the U.S. delay its uh, in 5G, China's advances in 5G. Still, uh, uh, 
uh, still uh, the Trump administration or the US has to take its allies together in its campaign against China. So one of the proposal uh, given by the recent CNA study, uh, Center for a New American Security Study, is to uh, form a new international uh, fabrication consor consortium, just like the uh, uh, COCOM, COCOM of the uh, old Cold War. So it's a multilateral export control regime. So uh, to form that, uh, form that regime with other semiconductor suppliers like Japan, uh, uh, Netherlands, South Korea, and, and few others. So meanwhile, the uh, fear that uh, this all this tech war will lead to technological volatilization is, uh, I feel that it's exaggerated because even if you see the uh, previous telecom stand, uh, 2G, 3G, uh, uh, you can see that there were uh, different uh, standards adopted by national telecom networks. So for example, in India, we had so both CDMA and GSM. It's, so it's not like uh, once uh, uh, the, because of this tech war, the China will have its own 5G standard and uh, uh, US will have its own 5G standard and uh, it's completely decoupled, uh, uh, decoupling will happen. So, so to conclude, I would say that uh, even though the Trump administration's uh, actions appear to be destructive in the short term, uh, should be remembered that uh, uh, China's mercantilist behavior, if not tempered down, uh, will have deleterious effect on the Western technology dominance as a whole. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rahul. That was uh, very succinct. And uh, I must say that uh, you brought out all the key points uh, and the problems that are going on between India, uh, between China and USA especially as far as the technology, uh, U.S. would not allow, or the Western countries would not allow dominance in this particular uh, domain. And hence the tech war is something, because this whole drama that we are seeing today is essentially to defeat that very uh, edge that the Chinese had acquired uh, through their Huawei. And uh, so the balkanization of technology is how far going to be good for uh, the world overall uh, will remain to be seen. Uh, we do not know really. Uh, the board, I don't know. I mean, we keep telling in India that we also try to be uh, independent as far as chip manufacturing is concerned. That is uh, the backbone of the whole industry. Uh, but uh, very unless and until we some, see some change and some kind of an accommodation between the two. Competition is good. But at the same time, this kind of... Uh, uh, competition that decimates uh, one another uh, is not going to be good for the humanity. For, for, uh, uh, that's what I feel. Uh, because the technology can give you an edge at the same time, uh, an improper use of technology can create problems uh, for the people. So we need to uh, have a look at both uh, this thing. China has to mend its ways, obviously, uh, so that it is not seen to be far too intrusive uh, into the domestic domains of the countries that we are uh, looking at right now, uh, and so combined with a lot of its uh, foreign policy, wool warrior diplomacy, and other things, I believe that China, if it tries to impose itself, uh, may have uh, to face to its economy and its technology. Uh, so, thank you once again uh, for that very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, now, we, let's see, thank you, and let's see who's there now. I see Sway Yon Nandi. Uh, yes, madam. Okay. Um, I think we can request her now. Yeah, after the can you please? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very good. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Okay, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everyone. Yeah. Yes, just one second. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Wei Yone Nandi is a research intern at the Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Relations. Uh, she is going to talk about China's uh, soft power in Southeast Asia and interestingly it talks about void in the surroundings. Now soft power and the void have a dialectical connection I guess. So let's see how it really fits. Uh, if China is continuing to enhance its uh, soft power under the current scenario. The floor is yours. Uh, hello, 
everyone. Thanks for letting me participate in this section. I'm Nandi. And can I share screen now? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as uh, today I will be talking about China's soft power in Southeast Asia, which is lacking the surrounding. Uh, China has already gained its considerable global influence uh, due to its impressive economic development. Uh, meanwhile, the global leadership roles of the United States has remarkably softened by the American first policy of the President Trump. So it becomes important for China to promote its soft power by harnessing its offensive global image how should I say, tackling the severe shock of soft powers in Southeast Asia in order to step in as a peaceful and reliable world leader. Uh, the term soft powers and head powers originate from the American uh, scholar Joseph Nye. Uh, according to him, head power is, which is probably the traditional concept of power, is the caution. Uh, the use of force, economic sanctions, inducements or payments are part of it. Uh, on the other hand, soft power is the form of persuasion. It seeks influencing power, uh, influencing power to network, compelling narratives, uh, strengthening inter international institutions, and drawing on the resources that make a country naturally attractive to the world. In other words, uh, soft power is literally making the other want the same outcome that you want without directly involving in the decision-making process. Uh, Ninth finds out three pillars of soft power, namely positive values, uh, which is like government systems and development model, and culture such as literature, clothing, cuisine, and traditional moral values, and foreign policy, which means that foreign policy critics are credible or accessible globally or legitimacy of the foreign policy decisions. So how do we measure the soft powers of a country? Well, this is based on the subjective and objective factor listed here. And technically, China is applying the highlighted approaches to achieve its soft power in Southeast Asia. Of course, most of the Southeast Asian countries look up to the Beijing consensus, the combinations of the economic development with whatever political system it is. Uh, Southeast Asian countries also appreciate the BRI that promotes regional connectivity through the development of uh, infrastructure uh, from China to Asia, the Middle East, Africa to Europe and beyond. China also trying to grow its soft power through aid programs, which are not conformed to the International Development Assistance Senate without having any conditionality and mostly in the form of bilateral agreement. Uh, and now also training programs that are supported, that supported uh, public health agriculture and governance are also provided by China. Uh, the PRC also applied traditional tools of soft powers in Southeast Asia, such as promoting Chinese language and culture, educational exchange and media expansion. However, the studies show that the soft powers of China in Southeast Asia region as a whole is still no match to that of the US. Apart from some countries saying that they have no other choice but to align with China because of geographical uh, proximity, the territory state indicates more inclinations towards the US when it comes to choosing side. Uh, on the other hand, South China's uh, Southeast Asian country also aware of the growing, uh, growing influence of China's in the region, but as indicated by the chart, only a few parts of the region accept and welcome the China increase in influence and power in the region. In fact, uh, soft power is kind of like a magnet. It is to attract the others, to emulate you and to respect you and to admire you. It's genuinely originated from the society, the people, and not from the government. China's soft power seems to be more effective in Africa than Latin America than it does in its neighborhood in Asia. China has so many problems with its neighbor, Japan, uh, India, Vietnam, and the Philippines, that makes it really uh, hard to generate uh, soft power in Southeast Asia. Uh, meanwhile, the Western scholar points out that this is an unappealing political system of China that is degrading its propaganda effort in the world. But in the case of Southeast Asia, it is quite interesting to see that the country in Southeast Asia region seem to be okay with the China political system. 
First, uh, uh, the failure of the China soft power in the region came from the other factor, interestingly. First, historical time with China. The imperialist nature of China in the past is staying hand in the regional country, which is further enhanced by its accepted behavior in South China Sea dispute. And religious matter, such as disclosures of re educational codes in Xinjiang province, has greatly impacted the Muslim populations in the region. And uh, impossible nature and sympathetic approaches of the state owned enterprises in implementing the BRM related projects in the country also contribute as a factor of the failure of soft power. And the last but not least is the insufficient soft power, too. Because China's soft power is entirely run by the government, excluding the supporting level of the NGO, private companies, and influential individual, individuals. Uh, in the East Out conditions, information is abandoned. What is scared is to gain attention, and that depends on the credibility of the information. Investing solely on the government prerogative will not be impactful to get solar powers in this area. Uh, to conclude, China rights seem to be unstoppable in the Southeast Asia, but it is still lacking in ability to import solar powers in the region. China has also become aware of that solar power is something to be earned and not to be bought. Uh, we can see by the fact that changes in its diplomatic approach lately, such as using, using softer rhetoric, uh, promoting economic diplomacy, We lost the sound. All right. So yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very yes. much. It was, uh, thank you. Your last slide was very interesting. Uh, well, some of the very important points that you made, of course, and Joseph and I uh, started off this, but this has existed for centuries, the influence of culture and civilization, the values, the cuisine, everything that has traveled far and wide for centuries in our part of the region. And uh, it has created a lot of goodwill. And uh, you have won over much more than uh, the people, much more like Buddhism, for example, but also a cultural and religious uh, movement that went across and won over a very large uh, part of the people. The Chinese cuisine is very popular everywhere in the world. And uh, yeah. so, so it's yeah. Indian. And uh, so it, it's very interesting to see what you, you, you have said. Uh, what I found uh, really uh, interesting was that you said China has insufficient tools of soft power. Now, that is, yeah. uh, that is something that uh, uh, I guess because they already are investing a huge amount of money in their Confucius yeah. centers, uh, trying to introduce in Nepal, actually, the, I, I read somewhere that the uh, study of Chinese language is compulsory uh, in the schools now it's been introduced. So there they are trying and these are the long term projects uh, and the modern age. Uh, so the culture plays a very, very important part and soft power uh, plays well uh, when you have good intentions. And that is why it is, and that comes out of the polity of a country and how it uh, plays out in different parts. But of course, China has a lot to offer. It's a great country, civilization country. And if the political system there, which is extremely important corner of the Joseph Nye's power, uh, is actually from the triangle, uh, will decide on how China is perceived uh, as a great soft power or a great country uh, in future. Uh, now, I don't know who has joined us. Thank you once again. Uh, so, Ms. Akriti is here. Akriti uh, is yeah. there. Right. Okay, good. Welcome, Akriti. Can you unmute yourself? Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now, but we can't see you, so you can switch on your camera as well. Some connectivity issues, I'll try. Um, there's some connectivity is issues, I'll just try. Okay, yes, it's okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Akriti Vinayak is a research associate and a friend of mine, a colleague of mine from the Vivekananda International Foundation. And uh, she is 
going to deconstruct the Chinese dream. And what is the dream all about? And let us see how this dream is actually playing out for them. So that would be uh, very interesting because what one sees and views right now uh, is quite disturbing. So is that what China had thought the way it is or it has jumped the gun a bit too fast? Akriti, floor is yours. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me just show my screen. Yeah. I'll just show. You have, unmute, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Yes. Just a second. So can you uh, see this? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Yes, we can see that. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, deconstructing the Chinese dream. What is the Chinese dream all about? So before starting the presentation, uh, I'll just uh, briefly mention why I chose this topic. So uh, one day I was just talking to my friend and she asked me, what is your research topic and what are you working on? So I just uh, told her that I'm working on the Chinese dream. And uh, the first reaction was, uh, oh, Chinese dream, that is like the American dream. So this, that just provoked me and, you know, that just made me question that how Chinese dream is being, you know, uh, constructed by people. They think that it's equal to or it's similar to the American dream. But uh, that's what provoked me to research on this topic. So uh, that, that's just a brief introduction why I chose this because uh, there is one tent, one tend to juxtapose Chinese dream and American dream together. So uh, the Chinese dream, like, like other slogans in uh, China, there's been other slogans in China also, but why Chinese dream is unique and is important is what I uh, will uh, tend to focus. So um, this Chinese dream is unique to Xi Jinping, the current president, and he explained the dream in the following manner. So everybody has their own ideal pursue and dream. Today, everybody is talking about the Chinese dream. I firmly believe that the, by the time the CPC celebrates its 100th anniversary, we'll no doubt have achieved the goal of completely building a wealth society. And by the time of by the, by the time of uh, the PRC celebrates its 100th anniversary, we've become a prosperous, strong, democratic, civilized, and harmonious social modernized country on its way to the ultimate great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So the idea of rejuvenation is really very important here, and that is the main highlight of what Xi Jinping said. So the goals set by Xi Jinping are big and they were overtly ambitious because he said that Chinese dream requires to achieve 200, that is first 100 requires China becoming a moderately well-off society by about 2020. And the second 100 requires a climpment of the modernization goal of China becoming a fully developed nation by about 2050. So the point is that we are in 2020 and we see how things have changed drastically for China and for the whole world. So it's, it's really pertinent to understand how will Chinese dream go ahead. But the main idea is that more than a concept, it's used as a rhetoric and a strategy by China to portray it itself as a benign country, benign nation, not just to its domestic audience, but also internationally. So Chinese dream essentially is not just about the domestic audience, but it reaches out to Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, we do. So um, it's not just about for the domestic audience, but the, this dream is, as Xi Jinping once said, it's about the world. It's, and that's where the Belt and Road Initiative comes in. So the most interesting thing about the concept is that the unique is that it's not just restricted to the domestic audience, but it reaches out to the world and how through various strategies like Belt and Road Initiative, like uh, China, China's attempt to build another, uh, another world order, 
that is different from the American world order, and that's why uh, it tries to portray itself as having different ideals. So uh, essentially, what is unique about Chinese dream is that it's essentially vague, and it's essentially a lot of things. So it's rested on four pillars basically: that is strong China, civilized China, harmonious China, and beautiful China. So. um that's no well uh, okay so i was uh, talking about the beginnings of the chinese dream that is not this is first time it's been used so some sometimes it's been compared to thomas friedman's article who uh, wrote in new york times uh sometimes it's also been traced to the ancient chinese writings so um for instance uh zheng xiang so poet and a painter in certain song dynasty he wrote the famous light heart full of the china in ancient poem flower spring it is also referred to the period what china has referred to as a century of humiliation and there's also a patriotic novel named dream of china's flourishing of failure that was also published and also it's uh, sometimes it's also being said that uh, the xi jinping chinese dream is inspired by liu mingfu the retired pla senior colonel who worked on the china dream great path thinking strategic posture in post american era so he writes in his book that it has been chinese dream for century to, to become the world's leading nation so uh, the idea is that it's not a concept which was uh, intuitively imagined by xi jinping it's always been there but what is unique about his concept is that he uses it in a very uh, open ended manner so there is no no clarity in the concept itself so coming back to uh, when uh, this idea was introduced it was introduced uh, on 24 on november 29th when uh, he introduced at the road towards renewal this is a permanent exhibition in china where he introduced this idea and in on this visit he uh, basically uh, evocated this uh, idea and after that the idea is being you know uh, aggressively being promoted by him especially in domestically uh, chinese dream has been the hottest word of 2012 in fact uh, according to cknai academic journal databases some 8 to 49 articles with chinese dream had been published by china by mid 2014 and there have been major social sciences grants funded in china who have attributed to president xi thoughts in terms of china dream subsequently there has also been research grants being granted by chinese academy of social sciences to examine and deeply study this idea Uh, not only academically but media houses like xinhua and also they organize array of themed activities that include essay writing competitions nationwide photography contest contest etc uh, there's also role of private sector here so interestingly uh, china's private sector is playing an important role in expanding chinese presence and influence in especially asia asia pacific and globally so um, like baidu alibaba and tencent also are uh, you know invading people at people's everyday lives and you know using the idea of china and chinese dream to reach out to more and more people specifically the most important about chinese dream was the poster campaign which is uh, the they are uh, I, i don't know if i can but uh, these posters are almost everywhere in china and uh, like a visual propaganda which uh, china is engaging in um but uh, the interesting part about uh, the poster campaign and also how china is promoting itself inside china is that it's promoting the idea of unity and harmony and says that chinese dream is fort unquote for all but uh, there's strong presence of han identity there so um the question of uyghur muslims or tibetan buddhists or other people they are not really in that picture so the inclusivity of concept is itself questioned similarly when uh, xi jinping talks about the chinese dream equals to world dream and that's where belt and road initiative comes in uh, and they keep on reiterating the fact that it's not hegemony it's not a hegemonic project but clearly what is happening currently and what is being happening throughout um, uh, years in the internet initiative is a clear uh, cut uh, 
idea of hegemonic and a chinese centric world order basically so um so in conclusion i think uh, i'll quickly conclude by saying that um, the current crisis the covid 19 crisis has exposed the fragility of the concept itself so um, this was a very important and pivotal year for china uh, for the chinese dream but of course things got uh, changed drastically and uh, however china is trying to come back and is trying trying to improve its economy and all but the fact is that the the chinese dream remains with a lot of paradoxes and asymmetries especially inside china uh, there are we see hong kong protests we see um, uh, how uyghur muslims are being treated we see how belt and road Ish- initiative is being uh, you know uh, aggressively people are against it so the whole idea the whole inclusivity idea of harmony and all those concepts really get uh, blurred and really you know we one should really question these uh, benign uh, narratives of china so that's what uh, i really wanted to deconstruct that chinese dream is not really about uh, everyone and it's not just inclusive and it's not just a happy idea but uh, it has its own uh, nightmares it's, it has its own uh, stories behind it thank you so much thank you akriti thank you very much so you have very well put that it's not a happy idea uh, it's true that uh, it's chinese dream if you call it or you can call it the cultural aggression in a way or in which be at the top and that everybody looks to it and identify it as the world dream uh, obviously china is trying to do now in modern china China does not have to worry too much because it's an ancient country with the ancient civilization known everywhere. But the modern projection that is happening of China is creating more resistance uh, than really the big countries following. But the interesting thing is, of course, we have seen various uh, Confucian centers, and now in the U.S. they want them to become like uh, diplomatic missions and uh, you know uh, those kind of things. So that. They're, they're, this is the role of a cultural organization that they are doing it. The government is funding it because it's a government-oriented political system that they focus. Uh, this was also mentioned by the previous speaker about uh, the the, the uh, cultural uh, accession of China into the global landscape uh, through the that's the government-oriented, and that's why that has been. Uh, of course, the harmonious uh, or to achieve harmony, inclusivity in the society. is very questionable and uh, the way they are dealing with uyghurs they have dealt with the buddhists in tibet tibet and all those problems continue to be there and uh, china will and china's foreign policy will be impacted a great deal as to how it behaves domestically exactly. and uh, very often it's uh, the the han identity i have been to mongolia i served there and i have seen the inner mongolia and outer mongolia and you see that how the identity has been superimposed over the mongol so that is also uh, the thing that continues and over the years and over time that goes on everywhere uh, so we hope and you have very well uh, analyzed and deconstructed this uh, chinese dream uh, it is a good dream if you were to think only in terms of its innocuous uh, influence but it this becomes a bad dream right. uh, when it uh, the kind of approaches they have uh, taken towards the humanity and that's where uh, it is going to be a big challenge in my view for uh, the for china and president xi jinping uh, who has opened so many fronts uh, now that i wonder that if he can put all the uh, jigsaw puzzle together but exactly. well, thank you again thank Atari. you sir thank you so much for the comment uh, really comment. means a lot thank you thank you thank you uh baki do we have anyone else now from our group because uh, So three speakers are absent. For three speakers absent, so I don't think that we have anyone else to make. Okay, so I will request if there are any questions. Do we have in that? There is. Let me see. Please send your questions and uh, the name of the speaker if you have any. Nobody has. I don't see. Paki, it is only your comment. So, so they explained it so well. It seems. All the speakers were excellent, and therefore there are no more questions. 
So I look into it. If there are any questions, I'll definitely put them forward on behalf of uh, all the people who have been uh, questioning on Facebook or YouTube. So I'll definitely put forward the questions. Uh, give me a minute. Children, so if you uh, want to take this session forward to the mode of discussion, it's absolutely your choice because we'll be otherwise ending it very early. I know, but then uh, the speakers have already spoken. Yes, please. What is India's interest in South China Sea? <laughs> uh, that may be lots. Uh, first of all, uh, India wishes to uh, is also one of the countries who wishes to maintain freedom of freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, and uh, regarding its um, uh, rival. Um, I would say rival um, China, India, Indo-China relations, especially it, uh, it is becoming worsening in the recent years. And uh, China and India are taking a tit for tat policies. And that's why uh, China, uh, South China Sea is one of the core interests of India's foreign policy. And uh, in terms of energy security, India is also um, uh, doing um, um, is also joining project has a joining project with uh, in uh, petrol Vietnam in the South China Sea and uh, it's uh, trade it is also an important trade route uh, to the eastern uh, part of the world with uh, India and because of all these uh, significances India has in the South China Sea India will always have interest in the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in today's world, as you know, that uh, the whole world is integrated and we are dependent on one or the other. And there are certain international rules of navigation that have been prescribed. And uh, this is uh, required for the freedom of navigation is extremely important and uh, for which India has stood up. And if you remember, that uh, Prime Minister Modi had spoken at the Shangri-La Dialogue mm -hmm. uh, in Singapore, where India's Indo-Pacific strategy was actually prescribed and which clearly indicated that uh, this is India, India looks at the inclusive, including with China. But whether it is in ASEAN, in the context of ASEAN, whether in the context of Indo-Pacific strategy, what you want, the sea lanes are open, transparent and uh, they, there are uh, no hitch, hitches, uh, Professor Lalda Sainman, as far as the trading lanes are concerned, or energy security, and there no threat should be there. But uh, China has recently uh, fl started flexing its muscles. It considers it as its backyard, and it's, as they say, the, the, the five dump. And therefore, uh, it has come into contrast uh, with other countries. And therefore, within the context now that the, the seas have always been one, Indo-Pacific strategy that is emerging and the collaboration that is emerging, from India's point of view, it is not China-centric. But from some other countries like the US, it is China-centric because Pacific is extremely important there. So they want to have the, the clarity everywhere. And we have seen what happened to Philippines that uh, the international law, if it is not uh, the, the jurisprudence, as well as judgments, if they're not respected by powerful countries, that leads to a lot of commotion uh, in the region and conflict can ensue. So that's the it's India's uh, interest that uh, we have uh, trade all over. India has been basically a trading nation in the world. So uh, we need to look at it from that point of view. And I'm not talking because I'm no longer with the government. So, but this is a, a general uh, comment. <coughs> well, uh, Mr. Ragul, there is a question for you now that India has recently adopted Art Nirbhar Bhar, where it wants to decouple with the Chinese economy. Can Indian economy sustain without China? Mr. Ragul. Yes, sir. So, uh, to like you like, uh, yeah, Art uh, Nirbhar, it's an add on to the earlier, like make, make in India. The plan is to. Uh, uh, attract foreign companies to come and make in India. So, like if the Indian economy is not like uh, compared to the US economy, not that uh, uh, 
too much coupled with the Chinese economy. So both the US and Chinese economy is too decoupled, but Indian economy, it, uh, it's too reliant on uh, even low and manufactured goods uh, from China. So like in those sections, that is a huge possibility that India can decouple from like, uh, uh, become self-sufficient in the low and manufactured goods. But if you look at the uh, uh, Chinese advancements in uh, high technology areas, so even it's competing with the US in high technology these days. So once it becomes a case, like it will be complete, like in technology side, it will be very difficult for India to decouple completely from, Europe, uh, from China. So it can do it on the low end, low end manufacturing side, like uh, if we import a lot of uh, toys, uh, shoes and uh, those low end, thing, low end goods, which makes up for a uh, good amount of a trade deficit. Those areas it's possible for a long term view has to be taken if uh, you want to completely decouple from China and it, I don't think in a globalized world, uh, it would be possible. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Raghul, you are absolutely right. But let me just say that Aat uh, which literally may translate as self-reliance, uh, does not necessarily mean the self-reliance of the 1980s. What India really hit India immediately in the wake of the COVID-19 was that more than 70-80% of the APIs as far as health sector is concerned were being imported from China, even though India is a pharmacy of the world, but it was importing the basic ingredients and APIs from China. So that gave you an idea and the more, a lot of these electronics and uh, other things that are very important uh, for your own. Uh, this thing. So that gives you an idea exactly that you need to be uh, competitive in the world yourself. You need to produce and whether you can do that or not that they showed uh, in the wake of this uh, COVID-19 because we did not even produce masks or PPEs uh, before the pandemic, but today India has emerged as a major exporter, not only using it. So it, this is same thing uh, uh, applies for many other things that India can do much better. But it is not self-reliance in the limited context. Atnirbhar means self-reliance, producing yourself, gaining a competitive edge and comparative advantage for plugging into the global supply and value chains. So that is extremely important. Now the question of decoupling, whether you can 100% decouple, I wonder. Any world in the world, anybody can decouple completely, and not from the Chinese or the Indian economies that are going to be uh, much more uh, uh, pliant in the world, much more forceful, much more presence everywhere. So it may not happen the the decoupling, but definitely, as mentioned by Raghul. There are a lot of low-end consumer goods where you can compete effectively uh, and can uh, do that. So that that's there. Now, next question is to Akriti. Uh, China talks about shared prosperity while uh, talking about the China dream. How far China is inclusive and committed to take countries towards prosperity through their China dream? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, uh, before that question, there's another question on, uh, I think this it's for Julia, there's lots of debate of China putting countries who debt trap through BRI. So I think that really answers my question about how China is not at all inclusive and committed to take countries towards prosperity through its idea of Chinese dream. Yes, the idea is uh, inclusive. Yes, the uh, narrative which it, it uses is it tries to cover uh, every uh, country. But uh, the reality is not there. And also, um, I think it's the, all the project China is doing it's for itself only. So when we see Belt and Road Initiative also, so it's Chinese labor, it's, you know, Chinese uh, banks, firms which are being involved. So um, there's, uh, there's no space for other countries to actually prosper and especially what we seeing uh, what are we seeing right now especially in J uh, china's relations with india japan or how it's behaving in south china sea so it really um, just you know questions its own uh, ideas itself so uh, i think uh, i just wanted to say because that question just juxtaposed was with my question yeah so thank you. And uh, now, Julia, you may like to take the question. <clears throat> there are lots of debate of China putting countries into debt trap. What is your take? Uh, it's true. The Belt and Road uh, <clears throat> spending in developing countries uh, has raised uh, serious concern, uh, concerns about uh, debt sustainability. 
Uh, and uh, according to recent uh, reports, uh, it was found out uh, that uh, eight um, Belt and Road uh, recipient uh, countries, such as Djibouti, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Laos, uh, Maldives, uh, Mongolia, and uh, others uh, are at high risk uh, of that uh, distress due to these huge loans. And of course, these countries, uh, they face uh, rise in uh, debt to GDP ratios, even sometimes beyond 50%. Uh, and as a result, these countries, they um, need to repay. Uh, and uh, as um, on the example of Pakistan, uh, they turn to the IMF uh, for an uh, IMF bailout, uh, which helps them to um, pay for projects uh, in terms of infrastructure and uh, energy projects. However, the um, international financial institutions uh, have already uh, paid attention to the uh, critical situation in some countries uh, that uh, occurs. And uh, uh, for example, the IMF uh, has uh, scrutinized uh, multiple aspects of the Belt and Road, warning of uh, unsustainable practices and debt levels uh, and so on uh, that uh, makes China um, apply a more safe approach to giving out loans to less uh, developed economies. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Julia. It was very detailed and uh, uh, a very good question, but frankly, it is like a dilemma. Uh, what do the developing countries do? Where does this money come from if they want to develop? And if China is providing, it is providing at the behest of uh, those countries. Of course, it fits into its strategic dynamic uh, but uh, it is a cash 22 for the countries uh, that are taking uh, the money. They eventually they fall into debt trap or they are they taking more than they can really chew. So that is something that has happened in Africa that's happening in Pakistan. We are seeing in Central Asia. So this kind of a stress factor as far as debt to GDP ratio is concerned is building up. And that could uh, well be uh, that has actually uh, uh, made the Chinese rethink about their strategy. We have seen in the last China-Africa summit, they wrote off a lot of these debts that they had given to these countries and are providing more grant uh, and more soft loans. But uh, the, it is really something because when you are looking at gigantic scale of uh, infrastructure development uh, across the DRI, then you are bound to have uh, those kind of debt traps that are happening. Uh, besides the model that China follows uh, clearly heads towards that. Thank you once again. Uh, the other question is uh, to Sway, uh, can you please highlight some of the BRI projects in Myanmar and what is their status? Are there voices against any BRI projects? Um, according to the research group uh, recent report, it is highlighted that there are altogether six BRI projects in Myanmar, but uh, them, but two of them are really, how should I say, prominent in implementing because uh, it is self use special economic zones and uh, Muslim manly railway. And uh, how should I say, they, they, they have been agreement, uh, there has been discussion, but they, uh, the uh, implementation plan is yet to be discussed because the Myanmar government is also aware of the public opinion as well as uh, the strategy locations of the country. Uh, they are being considered of the other other consequences such as uh, land confiscations, uh, environmental and health problems, and also maritime security issues. So that uh, it can be said that Myanmar is included in the BRI, but uh, uh, the 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 progress isn't uh, really prominent or it is it isn't really visible. Yeah. So can you say that it is because of the uh, negative perception on uh, China by the public as well as they have to, they have to aware of the, how should I say, the political interest of Myanmar. Yeah, thank you. So you don't see that there are any voices against the BRI projects or the any protests? Uh, yeah, they, they have, uh, they are some voices too, like, uh, especially most from the general public. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we, we are, we are a developing country, we can't be ignore our how should I say, the giant neighbor, so that, uh, excuse me, can I, can I mute for a second? Yeah, uh, can I mute? Yeah. Sorry, uh, 
yeah. so uh, mm. it's from the it's mostly from the general public. So they, they are worried about the environmental uh, environmental issue. On the other hand, we are uh, we we can ignore giant neighbor, which is also the right hand power. So we have to uh, consider all of both pros and cons of that benefit. It doesn't mean that we we can't take on this implementation of a project, but we have to be considered of considering of the uh, consequences of those projects. That is this is how the government is doing. Uh, they they aim to make sure that the public opinion on the project is positive, and also they being uh, really thinking about how they will take uh, how should I say benefit of that project aside from the negative opinion of that project. Uh, can I make clear? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that we have no more questions here. I mean, among the attendees at the moment, any other question, please ask before we wind up. Uh, so even I cannot see any further questions coming in. Uh, so okay. maybe half an hour before. Okay, doesn't matter. Well, I would uh, like to thank all the panelists. Frankly, they were very really enlightening views, very pointed uh, approaches, very clear-cut thoughts by each one of you, and uh, I'm sure that our younger colleagues and uh, would who are listening to us through the Facebook as well as participating today would have found these very useful. Uh, then uh, we, we have to look at uh, China is going to be there. China is uh, a big power, but the big powers have to also take their neighbors together. They have to have a very positive attitudes uh, towards their neighbors rather than creating debt traps or competition scenarios. Uh, that is what will make the strength of China much more. And I hope that the leadership does not consider the neighbors as their vassal states or the countries who will always listen to them or who have no voice. That is going to be a bit of a difficult uh, proposition uh, for, the, uh, for a great power. Everybody looks up to China's rise and it is going to happen. I mean, the countries in the region, uh, they are going to be there, but then the, what path we take. Today, as we see the world, unfortunately, whether in the COVID scenario or whether in the context of US-China rivalry or India-China rivalry, uh, I believe that uh, this is becoming a, a major challenge uh, for the world exactly to identify how this growth of China uh, whether it will be a benign growth, whether it is going to have a malignant uh, aspect to it, uh, remains to be seen. And uh, we have seen that China has tremendous strengths. It is already a big power. And it has to see how it uses soft power we discussed, whether this soft power can really remain soft or can be used to arm twist some with its hard power is a bigger question. And uh, I don't know if somebody from China is there, but I think that we need to look at it. Exercise of power depends on what kind of games we are, or aims we have, what kind of games we are going to play in the international domain. But if your neighbors are not prospering with you, I hardly can you prosper like an island. So I would like to close at that and thank all the uh, participants as well as the NICE to host this, this particular webinar. And uh, Paki, over to you. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, distinguished speakers, chairs, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the second session, it's my honor to propose a word of thanks on behalf of NICE to all those who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. First of all, we would like to express our gratitude and sincere thanks to Ambassador Anil Trignoyat for, uh, for agreeing to chair the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all our speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing uh, presentations. We are really honored to have you all as speakers with us today. 
we would acknowledge uh, we would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community experts academia media and different organizations finally i must mention deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on facebook thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions we are truly obliged to have you all with us this day and we hope to stay connected with you in future as well it's really been a pleasure also do join us for the next session thank you so much